Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah from Powerful Medical, and I would like to welcome you to today's session, Subtle Acute Coronary Occlusion Myocardial Infarction and its Mimics. The session will be presented by Dr. Stephen Smith, creator of Dr. Smith's ECG blog, the biggest ECG blog in the world, and also a faculty physician in the Emergency Medicine Residency at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis, and also a professor of emergency medicine at the University of Minnesota. He will be joined by Dr. Pendle Mayers, emergency physician and associate professor at Carolina's Medical Center. He is also a co-editor of Dr. Smith's ECG blog. They both dedicated their careers to spreading knowledge about the importance of OMI paradigm shift, and that is why we are all here today. Today's session is a second webinar about the OMI paradigm shift, in which after hearing your feedback, we decided to focus only on case analysis. If you missed the first session, we covered an introduction to the OMI paradigm shift and also several cases. You can find it on Powerful Medical YouTube or Steven's blog in the lectures and podcast section. During the whole session, we will be collecting your questions that will be answered at the very end. You can find the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And now, without further ado, Stephen and Pendle, enjoy. Okay, Sarah, Great. thanks for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining in here. I just have to first say that I have the relevant financial relationships that are listed here. And especially important is that I'm a shareholder in Powerful Medical. And since I'll be telling you a lot about the Queen of Hearts, which is a, a, a product of Powerful Medical, then you have to know about that. I've been teaching people EKGs for free my entire life. My my blog is pre open access, has been forever. I do not do this for the money. I do it to save lives. So uh, don't worry about that conflict of interest. Pendle has the same conflict of interest. And here we go. This is this is the blog where you can find all kinds of resources. Omi Manifesto. So we uh, I've been teaching teaching that there are non-STEMI that need the cath lab now and that there are the, the STEMI non-STEMI dichotomy is a false dichotomy for a long time. And in 2018, Pendle and I decided to write the OMI manifesto. And we, it, we realized that uh, acute coronary occlusion just needs a new name because STEMI is not adequate because ST elevation is a terrible way of trying to make the diagnosis of acute coronary occlusion. We just have to call it by what it is, an, an occlusion myocardial infarction, not an ST elevation myocardial infarction, the coronary artery is occluded, and that's what's important. ST elevation is not what's important. And you'll see that here in these examples that we're going to show you. And on the blog, you can find also if the OMI quizzes are interesting. You can take a quiz yourself. The OMI pocket guide is an amazing summary of many of the great cases on Dr. Smith's ECG blog. You can go to the AMI Queen of Hearts, OMI facts and references, OMI literature timeline, uh, and many lectures here under lectures and podcasts. Uh, so we're going to go on to the first case. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to show the case and Pendle's going to do his analysis and then we'll show you what the Queen of Hearts said. So Pendle, All this right, is a patient with chest discomfort. Okay, acute chest discomfort in an adult, I assume. All right, so um, we'll give a couple seconds for everyone looking to kind of imagine what you would do in your in your practice and what you see. And then I'll be um, saying what I what I see. Okay, so I'm very worried about <clears throat> the um, anterolateral walls uh, having acute coronary occlusion. Uh, the things that I see are include um, ST elevation in V1, V2, uh, touch in V3, V4, V5, lead one, and barely maybe an AVL. They all mostly have hyperacute T waves, and most hyperacute is probably V2 and V4. I think um, we also have reciprocal findings in lead three, which is um, very helpful, but not always present in acute LED occlusion. There is this angry down sloping ST segment that barely comes up at the very end, like the, the normal T wave there would probably be upright. It's almost being dragged down by this reciprocal ST depression in lead three. So overall, very concerned for acute anterolateral wall coronary occlusion, probably LED. Maybe lead B2 has the tiniest Q wave. Um, that could be a new, a new pathologic Q wave. So all these findings together make me very concerned I think it's pretty close to diagnostic in that scenario. What do you think, Steve? And I would also add that the T wave is not so big on its own, but compared to the size of QRS, it is. Same thing, especially in V4. QRS is very tiny and proportions are critical. T wave is far too big for that QRS. So what happened here? Well, the emergency physicians thought this was an acute coronary occlusion and they activated the cath lab. 
five cardiologists came to the ED. They said it's not a STEMI. And it does not uh, technically meet STEMI criteria. So it is not a STEMI. Cath lab was canceled. Patient ruled in by rising troponins and eventually went to the cath, tab, cath lab, but only after there was a lot of myocardial loss, 100% LED occlusion, a large MI. It was not a false negative because the final diagnosis was a non-STEMI. So it, that, that brings up the um, no false negative paradox that if you if you don't meet if it doesn't meet STEMI criteria it's not a STEMI so it's not a false negative EKG it's a it's a true negative EKG it's false negative for it's it's true positive for occlusion and so there's also a formula that I developed and if you if you use the formula for that EKG it would have been greater than the best cutoff 18.2 the formula also would have diagnosed it this is what the we sent to the queen of hearts and the queen of hearts says omi oh, with high confidence so that's how valuable this AI tool is Here's another patient with chest pain, Pendle. Okay, we'll give a couple seconds for the audience to, to think through this. There's a big elephant in the room that we have to figure out, right? Um, I think everyone is, I see some, some people uh, giving the right answer in the chat, but um, the thing we have to figure out is whether this very dramatic ST elevation in the anterior lead, especially B1, 2, 3, and these T wave inversions, it's very dramatic. The question is whether it means anterior wall acute coronary occlusion or whether it's some kind of fake or mimic or baseline uh, variant. <clears throat> and in this case, um, the, the way that Steve and I have been describing this variant in, in the literature is called benign T wave inversion pattern. Okay, so this is, um, we have an excellent R wave progression. I mean, R waves that go off the page in you know V3 and V4 in the areas where we're looking at this ST elevation. The T waves are not too big compared to the massive R waves. There is a picture perfect J wave on V. This works than the one before. It's just evolving. It's active, ongoing. And so this patient, uh, this is clearly a, an acute OMI. And the patient, fortunately for her, she had a cardiac arrest. Why do I say fortunately? Because that brought her to people's attention. When she had a cardiac arrest, ventricular fibrillation, she could be defibrillated. And then they would realize that she was having an acute coronary syndrome and go to the cath lab. So that's what happened. Uh, she went to the cath lab quickly because she had a cardiac arrest. And that was her LAD, which is completely occluded here. And then it gets partly opened up with a wire and then fully opened up. And uh, she did not lose nearly as much myocardium as she would have if she had not had a cardiac arrest. Now, if you send this EKG to the, the uh, Queen of Hearts, what she say? She says, OMI with high confidence. That's the first one. Uh, I'm not sure I sent the second one too. Oh, and there's the explainability map where she's looking at these big T waves and also at the QRS, the lack of R wave. All right, here's another case. This was texted to me in the middle of the night. 60 year old with classic chest pain. Cath lab is occupied for the next 90 minutes. Card says not a STEMI. Thinking of giving lytics. What's Pendle think? I think this is a fantastic case because it's, it's difficult, it's subtle, and you can still see something really important even through the quality that we have, the problem, the quality problem that we have on the limb lead side. Um, but really, it, this teaches you what matters most, which is the proportions, right? So leads V3, V4, V5, V6 have otherwise what could be normal QRS complexes. They're just small. They're narrow, normal axis and everything. But then the T wave that comes after them can't possibly be their baseline and it's four leads in a row at least. I think probably one in ABL might have a smidge of elevation if there had been good quality, but I just can't see them very well. I, even though there's bad quality, I can see depression in three and ABF, which fits along with that anterolateral pattern. So this EKG is a victim of, of uh, voltage and proportionality, which is why it doesn't meet any criteria. So I texted back, this is OMI. Did you give lytics? Proximal LED, great catch. And then he texted me an EKG later that was 100, oh, me, he texted me the baseline EKG. And you can see the baseline has much better QRS voltage here. And the T wave is smaller and the T to QRS ratio is much smaller than it is here. So this is baseline. And then he texted me an EKG from 100 minutes later. And this is it. And uh, you can see that the T wave now is even bigger compared to the QRS than it was here. Uh, it's, uh, it's evolved and eventually um, again, the baseline is here, and eventually the patient did go to the cath lab. We send this patient to um, the Q queen of hearts, and she knows immediately that this is omeothiac confidence. And this lower one, which was the first EKG, 
She says omia with mid confidence. So she she recognizes these uh, patterns very well. And the patient did get did have an LED occlusion. And again, we get the explainability map on both of them, which shows that it's highlighting the large T wave, large T wave here, highlighting the small QRS. And here's another patient, a 29-year-old black male with severe chest pain. Everybody's looking at this and thinking, what would I do with this patient with acute, is it active chest pain, yes, yes, Steve? Yeah, it's active chest pain. Okay. Um, so the question is, is all of this anterior elevation due to acute anterior wall, acute core inclusion, or is it a fake or is it venial or repole or something like that? I think this is a really difficult one, uh, to be honest. And um, part of what makes it difficult is you do have good R waves. Um, you do have what might be a J wave. I'm just not really, um, I'm not really able to call V3 a J wave is the big problem because there's no end of this QRS complex. It's terminal QRS distortion, unless you call that a J wave. And a lot rides on whether you're gonna call that a J wave or not, because if it's a J wave, that would be an explained reason not to have an end of your QRS. But if this is terminal QRS distortion and this 29 year old guy has an acute LED occlusion, that's gonna be terrible if we think, if we if we try to say that's not as a J wave instead. So yeah, let, um, let me interrupt. Okay, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna tell them what Q, terminal QRS distortion is. Yeah, Whenever so you have normal ST elevation, there should be an S wave in both V2 and V3. The exception to that is if there's a, a prominent J wave. There is no prom there is no S wave here, right? It does not go down below the PQ junction. So there's no S wave. And there really is not a J wave either. Uh, it's just flat there. And there's a J point and flat, a J point and flat. So this is terminal QRS distortion. And we've uh, we've shown that terminal QRS distortion is never seen in normal ST elevation. So this is not normal ST elevation. You have to assume it's OMI. Anything else you want to add to that, Pendle? Um, I, I just want to emphasize this. I think this is a difficult one because there are some benign features, but I think the terminal cure distortion just can't be overlooked and it has to be LED occlusion until proven otherwise. But I don't think it's the easiest case we have today. Yeah, totally. It's not easy. Definitely not easy. And the, the doctors who were taking care of this patient thought that this was his normal EKG. Then the patient's pain went away and they recorded another EKG. And this is it. And what do you think of that? Pain-free <laughs> now. Yeah. So we've we've proven whether or not it was uh, a mimic or not, because sure, mimics can change from EKG to EKG, but now all of the ST elevation has resolved. The T waves are way smaller and way less angry than they were just, what, minutes ago, Steve? How long was this? Yeah, yeah of minutes. This okay. one is 29 minutes after this one, I believe. Yeah. So this means that the first one has to have been acute anterior wall uh, transmural injury. And so, because it's it's all resolved and and, dy and dynamically resolved, so um, now I know for sure what the first one was because I compared it with this one. And notice also th there was terminal QRS distortion. Now the S wave is reconstituted in V three. There's an S wave now because the artery is open. So when when the doctors taking care of this patient saw this, they realized that this meant he had LAD acute coronary syndrome. And while, and they decided, and then they were going to activate the cath lab, but before they could activate the cath lab, he went into ventricular fibrillation and could not be resuscitated. So he died at age 29. Hey, Steve, now, um, send it, we send it to the queen of hearts. She says, Omi with high confidence. She sees all these things instantaneously. Oh, and there's the explainability map. Again, it's looking at that big T wave, big T wave here. It's looking some at the QRS. Uh, I'm not sure she sees the QRS distortion. Maybe there's a little bit of dark blue right there. Good questions in the chat that I wanted to address. Oh, so okay. um, we have like an overwhelming response that of uh, people that think this, uh, that are worried about acute coronary spasm, vasospasm. And I just wanted to take a minute to explain um, sort of my, my view on that. So um, any, any cause of acute coronary occlusion, whether it's typical type one ACS, whether it is vasospasm or any other cause, um, embolus somehow, any cause will make the EKG look the same way because the, the EKG is a picture of what the cells are experiencing. And so these cells are experiencing acute transmural infarction and then suddenly that is alleviated. That doesn't mean that it's for coronary spasm. 
any of those causes can, can occlude and then reperfuse. And type 1 ACS is still overwhelmingly way more common than vasospasm causing full acute coronary occlusion. So I don't think that we have any way of saying that this was vasospasm rather than an LED thrombus that went from 100% back to 99% with just a little bit of flow. Do you have any other comments on that, Steve? Also, the, the idea of vasospasm came around before, before we knew mu as much about acute coronary syndrome as we do now. Now we know that you can have uh, plaque that is outside the lumen of the, the coronary artery and can rupture and cause uh, acute thrombus and the acute thrombus can lyse and the artery can look completely normal on an angiogram, even though it really was acute plaque rupture with acute thrombus. The vast, vast majority of what we thought in the past was spasm is not spasm. It's, it's transient thromb thrombus occlusion with lysis. So the, the incidence of spasm is really extremely low. One more question in the chat I think is relevant, Steve. Um, there are some people that are asking, why aren't we seeing reperfusion T waves on the second EKG? And I'll answer that by saying, um, everybody takes sort of different amounts of time to get from the occlusion stage of the EKG down through normal into the reperfusion stage. And so I just think that second EKG has had time to deflate into the sort of pseudo normal range, but not yet had time enough during reperfusion to have terminal T inversion. So later EKGs maybe would have shown reperfusion if it had stayed open, but unfortunately this patient died, so it, but it probably re-occluded, yeah. right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, there are times when the occlusion is so brief that there is, you get ST elevation that resolves and there's actually no infarction. The troponins remain negative. That can happen even in the area of high sensitivity troponin. And in those, those are the only cases where you don't get T wave inversion, reperfusion T waves. There, for reperfusion T waves to occur, there, I've never seen one without some amount of inf actual infarction, a cell death, a positive troponin. Great. Next case. Good this session. is a 42 year old male who had burning from his epigastrium to his throat. He was otherwise healthy. He was completely relieved with Malox and lidocaine. And the uh, computer algorithm said it was a completely normal EKG. And so did the faculty physician who was reading this EKG. Okay, giving a couple seconds for the audience opinion. And um, <clears throat> once again, we're, we're learning a lot about hyperacute T waves here. So I think this one's a little bit harder than some of the ones we've seen so far, but the, the T waves that I think are, are hyperacute are all of, the, all of them in the anterior lateral area. So V2, V3, V4, V5, one ABL. Lead three has a very suspicious um, reciprocal finding of you know, down sloping ST segment and T wave inversion. Um, AVF, I won't say that AVF has down sloping ST depression, but it's, it's it's kind of almost there. So, for example, the most hyperacute T wave, I guess, is probably AVL because of it's all about proportions, right? This is like a two and a half millimeter tall T wave, it totally like would have been reasonable in any normal context. But the QRS is only two and a half millimeters, but maybe total. And the area under it is huge compared to the area of that little QRS. That can't be their baseline. And you have all these T waves in a perfect distribution that makes sense. They're all together, they're all contiguous. Um, that's diagnostic of LED occlusion. I would also add that T waves in V4 to V5 should not be as tall as the QRS. I'll show you some, a normal. Normal V4 to V5 looks like this. You know, these T waves are much less tall than the R wave. These are way too tall and they're fat and wide as well. And I just I just magnified AVL to show you how huge that T wave is in comparison with the QRS. And if you use my formula, it would have come out to 20.1, which is greater than the cutoff of 18.2. The formula takes into account ST elevation, the QT, the corrected QT interval, the R wave amplitude in lead V4 and the QRS amplitude in lead V2. So it takes it takes into account not just ST elevation, but also the QRS amplitude. And by, by having the ST elevation at 60 milliseconds after the J point, that is a measure of T wave size as well. And that's why this formula is so good at diagnosing LAD occlusion. And this, this patient uh, has, we sent it to the queen. The queen says, owe me with high confidence on this EKG. She sees these hyperacute T waves uh, all over here. Uh, she didn't see this one very well, although she does highlight it here. Uh, and she does see this in negative T wave in lead three. Uh, this patient was thought to have reflux esophagitis and he was 
prescribed something for, for reflux. And as the nurse was discharging him with his Zantac, his uh, uh, ranitidine, he had a cardiac arrest. And um, that was fortunate for him because they had cardiac arrest while he was still in the emergency department because then they defibrillated him and got another EKG. And that was the EKG after defibrillation. And then he could get his artery opened. We're going on to the next case, 37-year-old with chest pain. Woman. Okay, a couple seconds for everybody. <clears throat> um, hopefully for everyone, uh, V2 just looks absolutely terrifying, right? Um, a lot of these T-waves are hyperacute, including V2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, but V2 is clearly the most ridiculous. Um, there may be a touch of FC depression in some of these leads, which qualifies this as what's called de winter, which is just a hyperacute T-wave plus a slightly depressed, like with FC depression in the same lead. I would call this de winter. Um, this is now, well, hyperacute T-waves and de winter are now, at least in the United States, um, one of the formal STEMI equivalents. And so um, thankfully we're learning more about this and, and getting more awareness about this, but this is a anterolateral area occlusion yet again. So yeah, this is absolutely diagnostic of LED occlusion. It cannot be anything else. And so this was not recognized and the patient had a negative initial troponin and she was sent home and she died. And they had a case conference later where 50% of physicians, even knowing that she had died, said that this EKG was normal, which shocks me. I, I, you know, it's hard, always hard for me to know wh whether I see something that other people don't or whether other people would also see it. And, and the fact that 50% of physicians did not see this, even though they knew the patient had died, tells me that people really are not tuned into hyper-QT waves very well. So I hope you guys will do better than, than this. And then we send it to the queen and she knows immediately, oh me with high, high confidence. Um, she sees this all and there's probably explainability here and those two T waves are massive. And that's why she gets high confidence on both of those and on the overall interpretation. Next case, this is, Pendle knows this one because he contributed it. It was handed to him at triage. He didn't know whether the patient, uh, who the patient was and that's the EKG. Yeah, I was just told to to sign this EKG from triage. Um, and when, when people hand me these EKGs to sign, uh, I, I think that they're just asking me to go check for STEMI or not, right? Because that's that's typically, um, I think, what happens at triage in most places. Um, so certainly no STEMI here, but very, uh, very um, concerning features. And they're all very small and all about proportionality yet again. So we have a very small QRS this time yet again. And we have a touch of SC elevation in V2, 3, 4. It's gone by V5 to my eyes. And then there's this very angry straight SC segment in V3 and V4, followed by a terminal T wave inversion at the very end of V3, 4, and a couple other leads. So this ratio and that angry morphology and that pumped up area that comes with that angry straight ST segment there even though it only goes up to 1.5 millimeters on that T wave, has a lot of area under that compared to that incredibly small QRS. Plus that T wave inversion, um, bringing up the idea of maybe there's a little bit of reperfusion there or a little bit of collateral or something, making that reperfusion pattern what people might call Wellens. So to me, it's a, a very specific EKG, even though it's also very small, uh, probably LAD uh, with pre occlusion. Okay. Uh, and so... As I understand it, Pendle, you then sought out the patient to ask if she had chest pain, and indeed she did, and you activated the cath lab. Is that correct? correct yeah. I had the patient yeah. brought to my area. I got the HPI, and she had still ongoing active chest pain, um, even despite the T-wave inversion. Um, and so I had to fight pretty hard, obviously, because the EKG is not that, um, not very uh, obvious. Um, I did do the cath lab, and she had an acute, full, Timmy zero LED occlusion, and had like what they called uh, like barely a, um, some uh, collateral flow from the tip of the RCA to the tip of the LED. So a little bit of reperfusion from a different vessel, which probably accounts for the reperfusion pattern. And she also had an old EKG to compare with, uh, which you can look at them side by side. This is normal, normal QRS, normal T wave. Now the QRS is much smaller and the T wave bigger. So you can see the difference there and see why this one is diagnostic. And it's diagnostic even without the old one. And we send it to the Queen of Hearts and she knows immediately, oh me with high confidence. This is amazing to me that she, that she the Queen can, can do this, but she knows that this is a hyper-QT wave and this is a hyper-QT wave. 
and she gets it. Do you, Steve, do you have the uh, um, Queen of Hearts on her baseline? It was normal. I just, oh, I don't think I had the Queen of Hearts on the baseline, no. It's amazing that she looks at those same leads and sees that proportion as being so perfectly distinctive, at which it is. Uh, she says the, the baseline is normal in this case, of course. Yeah. And there's the angiogram. You can see cut off right here in the LID, and then it's opened up. Mm -hmm. Next case, 32-year-old male with chest pain. Okay, give some seconds for the uh, audience. I think this is another hard one, uh, Steve. This might be one of the harder ones. Um, so we do have S elevation uh, and V1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, we have some tall T waves. They're not necessarily the fattest, most obvious hyperacute T waves in the world. But um, you know, the question is, what's the patient's baseline compared to this one? I'd love to know because I have seen people that I think could look almost like this at baseline. But if you do have the baseline, which I, I just remember this case from the blog, but if you have the baseline, it is very, very helpful. Yes. I would say that this EKG looks normal to me unless it's different from baseline, just like you said. And indeed, if you use my formula, formula value is very, very low. This, this the value this low almost always means normal ST elevation, also called benign early repolarization. Um, but in fact, there was an old EKG, and this was the patient's baseline ST elevation. You never know how much baseline ST elevation a patient has unless you have the, a baseline EKG. And uh, here you realize that this is new and is probably due to LED occlusion. And so this, in this case, the patient had two serial P point of care troponins, ISTAT, which are terrible. They shouldn't be used. They're not sensitive enough. Both were less than 0.3. But fortunately, I'm not sure, I can't remember how he figured it out, but he realized it was an LED occlusion. And the patient, and you, there you can see the, the contrast side by side uh, in V2 especially. And the patient went to the cath lab and had an LED occlusion. If you send this to the queen, the queen doesn't recognize it either because the queen of hearts at the version one cannot compare with an old EKG. So she can't see this either, just like I couldn't see it and Pendle couldn't either and, and neither could my formula. Uh, so in the future, the, the queen of hearts will be able to compare serial EKGs and compare with old EKGs. And there's the explainability. She's looking at the size of the T wave, but also the size of the QRS. He's, he really high at the size of the QRS here. And because it's so big, she says not only with low confidence, in this case, the T wave says OMI with mid confidence, but you put them all together and she says not OMI with high confidence. All right, here's two patients with chest pain. All right, so we have one patient top, different patient totally on the bottom. Um, we're going to assume they both have active chest pain. Um, and a um, couple seconds. <laughs> Test takers out there, usually when there's two, two patients at once, you should. Usually one is, is real OMI and one's not, but um, try your best to think about them individually. Um, and we'll start with, um, we'll start with the top one. Okay, so um, some similar features as the last case we just did, honestly. Um, we have a pretty normal QRS that has great uh, R waves and V234. We have a couple leads with what I'm comfortable calling J waves, especially V4. Um, we have kind of a, um, a T wave that looks reasonable to me for most of these QRSs. The, the exception would be V1. I think V1 looks pretty angry. Um, but overall, I, I think there's some benign features here. And I think this could be a normal variant ST elevation. The other option, of course, is LED OMI. So I'll be very careful, but I, uh, I, I'm, I'm leaning towards that this is probably not acute coronary occlusion in this case, although it's not the easiest one ever. I would add also that there is almost terminal QS distortion in lead V3, but that does just barely go down below the PQ junction. So technically there is no terminal QS distortion. So in, in real life, you know, what I'm going to do for this patient is I'm going to get a very good history. I'm going to um, get repeat EKGs uh, as often as I can. I'll do an echocardiogram. Um, if I get a good look at this patient's anterior wall and they have four millimeters of ST elevation and two leads with a perfect looking anterior wall. That just doesn't make a lot of sense and that would help swing me uh, in one direction. Um, so there, there's gonna be more things that I'm doing for this patient than just you know scrutinizing only this EKG. But I, I think if we get a little more information, we, we might be able to show that that's not acute coronary occlusion. Yeah. 
And in fact, it was not. And uh, my formula, LED formula was low, indicating that it is normal variant ST elevation. I would make the additional point that it does meet STEMI criteria easily. Uh, so let's go on to the next, the, the one below. Okay, I think this one is, is also very hard, Steve. I think you're, you're giving me the, the hardest cases. Um, we have a lot of similar features. We have um, a normal QRS, pretty good R waves. We have you know, it's kind of the same elevation areas in B2, 3, 4. Um, we've got elevation in 1 this time and ADL. Um, and look how similar you, you made lead 3, and yet somehow lead 3 in this one looks worse to me than in the last one. Um, what, what, why, Steve? What, why do I feel like this one's worse? Um, I'm having a hard time putting it in words. Do, do you have a particular feature you can point out about why I, I feel scared about this one? No, no. And in fact, to me, it looks like really like a normal EKG. However, when I apply my formula, formula was positive. So the formula, again, uses the, the ST elevation at 60 milliseconds after the J point lead V3. So about right there. So it's a lot of ST elevation at that point in time. You use the R wave amplitude in lead V4, the total QRS amplitude in lead V2, and the QT interval. And I don't have those numbers with me right now, but it they they turned out to come up with a positive formula value. Um, and this was an LAD occlusion. I and you can just this, this, this is just to point out that it is it can be very, very difficult to tell the difference between normal and LED. If you show this to a cardiologist, they just wave you off, like, oh, that's a normal EKG, but it's not normal. And um if you send it, send these to the queen, the queen knows this one is not OMI with high confidence. I think that's amazing. And she knows this is OMI, but she says she does it with low confidence. She's not quite sure. Now I want to show you the, the patient did have an old EKG, this bottom one. And you can see this is what his normal V2 and V3 look like and V4. And this is what it is when he's got LED occlusion. I saw this in a queue of ECGs uh, reading through the system. And uh, what do you think, Pendle? I'm glad you're turning the difficulty down a little bit because th those are really hard ones. This one is not hard. Um, anybody who's seen a lecture like this can see that this is uh, anterolateral acute coronary occlusion. Um, I think the leads that are absolutely diagnostic, you know, V3, V4, these can't be anything else but hyperacute T waves. All the T waves in the whole anterior leads and lateral leads are all hyperacute. And then maybe even more specific, maybe is this leads three and AVF, which have this down up sort of angry down sloping SC depression then pop up with a T wave at the end that is a reciprocal finding of you know the high lateral and the anterior area um, that has to be acute um, LED occlusion basically. Notice also that the R wave in V1 goes from V2 gets smaller to V3. When you have reverse R wave progression, it cannot be normal ST elevation and it's highly uh, suspicious for acute LED occlusion. Um, so I was, I was, when I was worried when I saw this case, I thought, oh my God, if this is, if this is a patient with chest pain, then it is an LED occlusion and it would be missed. And indeed it was missed. And the first troponin was negative and the second troponin returned quite elevated and they got a repeat EKG. And this showed that the entire anterior wall is now dead. And they went to the cath lab. It was an LED occlusion. The peak troponin was 140 nanograms per milliliter, which is the same as 140,000 in the high sensitivity era, uh, anterior wall motion abnormality, and the uh, the patient ended up with heart failure and a very poor ejection fraction. You send it to the queen, she gets OMI with high confidence. Again, she sees these T waves and she sees this down up here as well, which I think is very interesting. All right. Another one. I, I, it looks like uh, I'm doing all LED occlusions here. I hadn't noticed that, but uh, this was texted to me recently from a former resident. Okay, well, like the other ones, we have many, many leads with hyperacute T waves, uh, V2 through V6, 1 and AVL, even lead 2 sort of, and then lead 3 and AVF has it reciprocal. So um, by now in this lecture, everyone can probably see this very easily, I think. Yeah, okay, good. And um, I'd also point out this Q wave in V3, a little Q wave in V4, V5. So this was, my immediate response was acute proximal LED OMI. To me, it is obvious and diagnostic. And my former resident said, all my colleagues are amazed that I diagnosed this pretty obvious OMI immediately. I didn't think it was subtle at all, but they all say it is. So uh, 
But may, when next time you see a case like this, you'll amaze your colleagues by diagnosing an LED occlusion. You send it to the queen. She knows it's omia with high confidence. And the explainability tells you why against the big T waves. Uh, she doesn't seem to notice the Q waves as much, but she does notice this inverted uh, T wave in lead three in ST depression. And she notices the big T wave in one. Also, the explainability feature is relatively new and very experimental. Um, as far as we know, I mean, no one's ever done the queen already, but past that, no one's no one's had a great um, a lot of time to figure out how to do this explainability feature. So this is a very new thing. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the blue lines is exactly why you get the overall impression. So we're trying to catch up with the explainability feature, and that should get better with time. But oh, right now, the, the overall interpretation of the top left there is more reliable and more um, studied and more um, engineered than the explainability feature. It's this good. Okay. All right. Next case. Um, this is a patient with chest pain. Okay, good. We have something a little bit different. That's, that's, that's nice. So, um, uh, what first stuck out, stuck out to me here was there's a lot of depression in many places, uh, including V3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, AVL, um, maybe a touch in AVF. We do have, um, Anytime that happens, uh, one of the things that comes to my mind is, is it posterior OMI, which is usually maximal in V1 through V4, or subendocardial ischemia, which is usually maximal in V5, 6, and 2, which has elevation in AVR. Um, this one, to me, starts in V3 and then kind of sustains its severity as you go from V4, 5, 6. Those all kind of look similar. It's not getting better by V5, 6, also not worse than V5, 6. So... I think that component of the CKG looks a lot like seven cardio ischemia, but I wouldn't rule out posterior OMI. And then the other feature here is lead three. So lead three does not really correspond with just seven cardio ischemia. Usually there would be a little bit of depression like there is in, v, in lead two if it were just seven cardio ischemia. This is not that. This is what's called Oslanger's pattern, where you have actually elevation in hyperacute T wave in three on a bed of subendocardial ischemia pattern, or maybe a posterior OMI pattern. So this is either inferior OMI with subendocardial ischemia or inferior posterior OMI with subendocardial ischemia. Okay, and indeed, uh, it's Oslanger's pattern. And uh, very, the, the, the doctors were not, did not pay attention to this uh, well, and the troponin went extremely high before they got to the cath lab. Uh, and the Queen of Hearts recognizes as OMI with high confidence. And indeed, it was Oslanger's pattern. It was three vessel disease with an occluded circumflex. And the Queen of Hearts, again, she doesn't seem to see this lead three all that well, but she sees all that ST depression and says OMI with high confidence. Circumflex occlusion EF dropped from 66% to 48% with inferior and inferior lateral akinesis. The patient lost 18% of ejection fraction due to this large infarct. And you barely see it. So not even a millimeter in one lead. And, and yet it's a massive infarction. 60-year-old with chest discomfort. This might be my case, Steve, but I, I, I it definitely could be, yeah. I don't I don't remember where it came from. I remember it, I think it was mine. Um it's an excellent example. A couple seconds for the audience if you want. This time we we have um we don't have any any subliminal part of the ischemia, but we do have very subtle inferior omi as well as posterior. So I'm gonna call this inferior posterior omi. The things we have for the inferior omi is lead three has if you had just showed me lead three alone, I'm not sure that I could have said that's hyperacute. It's close. But when you give me lead three with ABL, then I know that it is hyperacute because ABL has too much negative volume in that T wave inversion for that normal QRS complex, which makes the lead three T wave probably almost definitively too big. Um, lead two and ABF are, are not super helpful because uh, they don't give me definitively hyperacute is but three and ABL are very, very concerning. And so whenever I have an inferior wall OMI that I'm that I'm suspicious, but not slam dunk about, 
I might look at the, the adjacent walls. The wall next to the inferior wall in, in my in, in my vernacular is called the posterior wall, the, the one that is exactly opposite of where lead V2 is, right? So V2 has SC depression. How many patients, how many normal people um, with a normal QRS have depression and lead V2? Very, very few. I think less than 2% of men and like less than 1% of women have depression in V2 and V3. It is so, so strange to have a normal QRS complex and, and depression in V2, unless you have acute posterior only in the right setting. So V2 is posterior only with that depression and lead three and ABL shows me the inferior only. Together, they lock each other in, they support each other. They make me more confident about both of them. And it is inferior posterior only. And in fact, we wrote a paper in the fall of 2021 in the Journal of the American Heart Association, where we showed that any ST depression, depression maximal in V1 to V4 compared to V5, V6, uh, any ST depression of any amount in a patient who you have high suspicion of ACS is 97% specific for OMI. So we send it as the queen of hearts. She knows it's OMI with high confidence. Again, she sees hypercute T waves. She sees this ST depression. The explainability especially points out the ST depression here. Next one, a 50 something with chest pain. Oh, okay. This is quite different than the other ones. A um, couple seconds for the audience. <clears throat> All right, so um, lots of abnormalities. W where to begin? Um, the inferior leads in ABL, I think, is is the the part that is easiest for me. So um, ABL has depression and a, a kind of a weirdly big T wave at the end. Um, so this makes me look at the opposite lead three. Although I can't really say that there's elevation in three. There may be, if you compare it to the very end of that, like right before the, the QRS complex, there's either no elevation or a tiny amount of elevation. And then there's a angry straight ST segment followed by terminal T wave inversion. So to me, and it agrees with Lee ABF, by the way, all the same features in ABF are there. So I see inferior reperfusion findings in three and ABF. Um, and that is uh, reciprocal of that as an ABL. Um, it looks kind of like it was elevated um, and occluded a minute ago and now is improving, although I never can tell the direction it's going, but it looks like inferior diffusion to me. And then I get to lead V3, and there's a, there's a little bit of SC depression in V3. Um, and so that makes me think there's also posterior only, or maybe improving or reperfusing posterior only. Um, there's also depression in other places like V5 and V6 and 2, which... Um, I guess could be a component of some of ischemia or a little leftover from posterior. This is a harder one, but I think it's like a, an RCA that's opening or just open. There was also, this is kind of upward convexity here. This is an AVF, I think is really specific for uh, an OMI, whether a reperfused OMI, it looks like a reperfused OMI because the T wave is down and because the T wave and AVL is up. This was not seen at all by anyone. And the patient was placed in a room with, uh, and, the intern went in to see him, and while the intern was evaluating him, the patient arrested and could not be resuscitated. He died, uh, and it's un it, it, apparently he did have chest pain. They say he had chest pain when this was recorded, which uh, so maybe not reperfusion, although it looks like reperfusion. If you send this to the Queen of Hearts, she did did not get it. Not Omi with low confidence. She did not. He saw this T wave inversion here. It was not, and that was Omi with high confidence in AVL low confidence in AVF, but she did not see it in this case, but it is low confidence. And so whenever it's low confidence, you have to be suspicious that something is wrong and you need to do more uh, evaluation. 45 year old male with acute chest pain. Couple seconds for the audience. Okay, I feel that this is a fake, a mimic. Um, Let's see. Um, you said 45. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I would probably, I would believe you if you told me the patient had LVH. It's got yeah, very high voltage. It overlaps in a lot of cases. Uh, may not have exact voltage criteria, but there's a very dramatic tall QRS nonetheless. Um, there is reasonable elevation for it, you know, in lead V2, V3. Um, so to me, this looks like a dramatic EKG, but I, I don't really think it looks like acute coronary occlusion. The T wave in V3 is big for its QRS. I would look at a prior for that, but um, 
it's very asymmetric. It goes up slower than it comes down. Um, I think that this one is not a cute coronary occlusion. What do you think, Steve? Okay, yeah, I think it looks like normal variant ST elevation. I will point out that it does meet STEMI criteria uh, unless the patient was less than 40, which he's not. Over 40 years old, all you need is two millimeters in V2 and V3, and the computer actually measures it for you here. It's 2.4 in V2, 2.66 in V3. So it, it and the, the, the conventional computer uh, suggests early repolarization, even though it meets STEMI criteria, which I think is interesting. Um, tall T waves consider acute ischemia or hyperkalemia. That doesn't look like hyperkalemia at all. Um, in this case, the formula value is 19.4, which would indicate that it was LED occlusion. Um, but if you send it to the queen, she says not OMI and with high confidence. She sees all these features that Pendle talked about. And the explainability shows, especially that she sees the QRS uh, and T wave are proportional the way I see it. All she says OMI mid confidence for that one lead. The rest of the leads don't add up to enough. And she says, not OMI with high confidence. Uh, in fact, the patient got that cath lab activated with a normal angiogram and there were normal serial troponins. Let's go on to the next one. I saw this one on, on our computer screen, reading through cases. And um, that's how I know about it. Yeah, we got some good uh, people correct in the chat. This is a really unusual mimic. Um, is it a right bundle? I guess it's um, not quite wide enough. Let's see here. It's um, either incomplete right bundle or full right bundle. Um, it's got this really unusual elevation in V1 and V2 with um, you know convex segments and uh, maybe a lot of area under there. But um, this is a really unusual mimic. I don't have a name for this one, Steve, but I it just doesn't look right. And I've never seen it. I've reviewed many, many thousands of, of OMIs, and I've, I've just not seen whatever is going on here. And it does not look like a few coronary inclusions to me. Yeah, I had never quite seen it either, and I, but I knew it was not a, acute coronary occlusion. And uh, in fact, previous the formula value was positive at 18.4. Uh, and it was proven to be an old mimic from all the old ECGs were identical. Uh, and if you sent it to the queen, she knows somehow that it's not OMI with high confidence as well. So the queen can really help you avoid false positive, avoid cath lab activations. And there's the explainability. She doesn't even, doesn't even have any blue on this ST elevation, a large T wave here, which I think is interesting. All right. Um, we're now at, uh, I, I thought we'd be going a lot farther than this. Uh, I've got like twice as many slides as we've gone through, but it just always, it always takes longer than I think it's going to take. And we've gone 55 minutes or almost, haven't we, Sarah? Should we go longer or not? Oh, well, feel free to do two or three more cases and okay. then I will uh, wrap up and we can move to the Q&A. Okay. Uh, so here's a 30-year-old woman with a heart score of zero. EDAX, Emergency Department Assessment of Chest Pain Score of two, which is very low, computer normal ECG and initial troponin less than the limit of detection. Pendel, whenever you're ready. Okay, sorry about the mute. So it's an inferior, only and probably posterior too. The leads V1 and V2 might be placed too high, but um, V2 still has that angry down sloping thing that makes me think about posterior and lead three and ABL have the perfect little combo of um, subtle, but hyperacute T wave and a negative hyperacute T wave and ABL. Um, so it's it's gotta be probably like an RCA occlusion. Yep. Uh, and then we send it the queen and she gets OMI with mid confidence. So she gets that one. And then she had, there was a serial ECG done on this person as well. It's a little bit different now. Now I'll, show, I'll put them side by side here, but this, this T wave looks different, but there's still ST depression and AVL. This is really hypercute compared to that QRS. And um, then you put them side by side. You can see that this, these are dynamic T waves here. To, this T wave gets much smaller, but still looks acute. This gets smaller, but the QRS also gets smaller. So it's an interesting dynamic EKG. And then, uh, so this is that first one, the second one again, excuse me. And if we send the second one to the queen of hearts, she says, OMI for that one as well. And, you put, and then the other thing I didn't show you was how the T waves have become hyperacute. 
So if we go back to this one, look at these T waves here. They look normal. But on this one, they are getting fatter. And I put them side by side here so you can see the difference. Here's a normal T wave, a hypercute T wave, a normal T wave, a hypercute T wave. They're just big and fat. Here's another case. <laughs> Massive hyperacute T waves in V2, 3, 4, 5, 1, AVL, and lead 2, and AVF. Uh, 3 is kind of weirdly quiet, but um, another case where the, 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 the worst thing you can say here is, well, there's no reciprocal depression. There totally is reciprocal depression. If you got leads, uh, if you got posterior leads, that would have reciprocal depression, but most people don't do that. Um, and so this is huge. It meets STEMI criteria. Um, it has a massive hypergeek QF. The problem in this case was the patient's age. So this is texted to me, acute chest. How could it possibly be an OMI in a 17-year-old girl, Pendle? I mean, come on, let's be real. There's pl plenty of ways, uh, anomalous coronaries, um, you get your, um, um, I'm blanking on the arteritis, but um, oh, lots of- talk about, uh, It's uh, Kawasaki's disease. Kawasaki, thank you. Um, yeah. Plenty of ways to have aneurysmal uh, coronaries uh, at any age. And um, when you have that, of course, you can have dissections, thrombus formation. Uh, it's not impossible just to have good old fashioned type 1 ECS at age 17 either. Um, all kinds of reasons. So it's unfortunately, so the, but not. Possible. I would say the worst thing you can be if you have an OMI is young or a woman, and especially if you're a young woman. In this case, I texted back, massive LED OMI, cath lab, might be an unusual myocarditis, but OMI until proven otherwise. And in this case, the cardiologist would not believe the 17-year-old had acute coronary occlusion. They did nothing about it. And she ultimately needed a heart transplant because she lost so much myocardium to this. And she indeed had had Kawasaki, Kawasaki's disease when she was young. I think it went undiagnosed. They only realized it when they found that she had coronary artery aneurysms and one had thrombosed. And if you send it to the queen, of course, it's OMI with high confidence because this is not a difficult EKG. It's that people get get fooled by the, the demographics, a 17-year-old girl. Speaking of which, here's a 27-year-old woman with acute pulmonary edema. Bedside cardiac ultrasound shows poor pump function and a wall motion abnormality. This is the good one. I'm glad we get one of these in at the end here today because not knowing this pattern is a terrible, terrible thing. So... The, 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 the OMIs with the highest mortality that are still alive to get an EKG show this. So the LED occlusion, the LED supplies the right bundle branch and the left anterior fascicle because they live in the anterior septum exactly where the, you know, the, the, the artery goes. So when you take out, the, when you have ischemia to those branches, you get this QRS, which is right bundle and left anterior fascicular block which makes everything much, much harder than it would have been before those were blocked. So here we have concordant elevation in V2, V3, um, and then we also have massive concordant elevation in 1 and AVL, so anterior, septal, and, and anterolateral areas. This is really hard if you haven't practiced with wide QRS about where to find the, the end of the QRS with the, the J point. Um, but in V3, I think it's pretty clear that that, that J point is like a little, like a chair almost right there on V2. One on ABL. In V1, yeah. you can see the end of the QRS right there. And if you follow it down along this line, you'll see end of the QRS there. So that is ST elevation. You follow this down, end of the QRS is there. So that is ST elevation there. Same thing goes here. That we, we found it's we found that that end of the ST elevation is right there. It's also right there. And you can go up and see that it's right there. That is ST depression, reciprocal ST depression. Go up to here, that's the end of it. That's ST elevation. This is called shark fin pattern. Um, it's also very important that you know, your colleagues who haven't had more training in, in this kind of thing will say that this is VTAC, and this is not VTAC. This is sinus tachycardia with a wide QRS complex and this shark fin morphology that makes people confused as to where the QRS even is. Um, so a very, very important problem. Um, and if you, don't th if you don't understand this, uh, this patient's mortality is going to be uh, uh, near 100 and I didn't point out the P waves that are here, here, and lead two, they're easily seen. So yes, it's sinus tachycardia. This was, uh, the, the, the emergency physicians immediately recognized this was a, a STEMI, and they activated the cath lab, and the cardiologist just poo-pooed it because he was 27 years old, and they could not read this EKG. 
So they did nothing about it. And she died of a left main occlusion with a peak troponin of 500,000. Let's see if there are any questions or comments. Thank you so much, guys, for these insightful cases, especially highlighting the last two ones. Um, I hate having to stop you since I know you have many more interesting cases, but we will do more sessions like these in the future. Oh, let, and, let me do um, one more thing, Sarah. Sarah, let me interrupt a second. I forgot to do one last thing. The Queen of Hearts got that one. <laughs> Hold me with high confidence, all right? <laughs> that, that one we just showed you? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Had to get that So. Out. um. I'm just happy to see a lot of engagement in the comments and this seems like the format that works for people too. Um, but uh, before we continue to the Q&A session, I would like to mention a few things about the Queen of Hearts AI model uh, because you kept mentioning it and we are getting a lot of similar questions. So I just want to add that in Europe, it is currently available in the PM Cardio app, which is a certified class to be medical device that you can easily access via App Store or Google Play Store. Just search for PM Cardio and you can test the app for free on few cases. At the same time, we are currently working on the FDA clearance for the US market. Uh, you can read the Queen of Hearts International Validation Study in the European Heart Journal. And I'm very proud to say that it, had, it has been the most read publication for months now. Um, additionally, we, are currently, uh, we currently have more than 30 centers uh, undergoing a clinical validation of the AI model. So expect more clinical evidence in the upcoming weeks. And if you would like to validate the Queen of Hearts in your institution, uh, please reach out to our clinical team at omi at powerfulmedical.com. I know this is quite a lot of information already. So everyone will get an email with all the important information within the next few minutes. This week, you will also get a certificate of attendance and the recording of this session so everyone can rewatch it at your own speed. And we try to answer as many questions as we could during um, the case presentation, but there are still some questions that I think we should answer. So I would give the word back to you, Stephen Pendle, and I'm sure you can see them, uh, the questions on your Q&A section. I'll say one other thing, which is that uh, we're happy to do many more of these in the future. Pendle and I are both EKG addicts. We cannot get enough of it. So we are we love going through these things. And um, if you want to see more of them, let us know. Um, okay, we have uh, five questions that we haven't really gotten to answer yet. Um, one of them is kind of simple. Um, can you tell us something about the mechanism or the pathophysiologic reason for hyperacute T waves? It's not simple because we know it very well. It's simple because I don't think anyone in the whole world knows it. <laughs> Steve, do you no. have any comments about no. that? We don't know anything about the mechanism. No one does. So yeah. it, this is all- If you know the mechanism of EKG findings, uh, I've, I've never found them to be believable or backed up no. like that. No, it's not. So it's just, you just have to understand that that's the way it is. And you're not going to explain the way it is uh, without some very fancy electrophysiology research, which no one has done yet. Mm -hmm. Next question is, um, is the other end of the spectrum. It's impossibly hard and impossibly common. How do we get cardiology to embrace the OMI paradigm and start taking these patients for emergent cats? From these cases and people's experience, that is the Achilles heel. Yeah. Uh, Pendle, you have more experience with having trouble taking people to the cath lab, so maybe you should answer that. Um, I mean, I... I, I I'll I, say, in, in my institution... I, uh, there was an, a terrible case in 2012, which I complained about, and they almost fired me for insubordination. But I, uh, because the case was so terrible, they were found to be the ones at fault. And then we came up with a new system where uh, they have to respond to emergency department cath lab activation. And ever since, and then we came up with a new plan. And since that time, our cardiologists uh, are are on board with the OMI paradigm, and they're always trying to figure out if if the patient has an acute coronary occlusion or not, and don't rely on ST elevation. So I don't have that problem. Well, that sounds really easy, Steve. We'll just all do that, and then uh, you know that'll be really easy. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, so the next question um, it says, "What is the false positive rate for OMI diagnosis with Queen of Hearts?" Um, it's a hard question to answer. Um, the only uh, I can, have, you can have, I answer that because right? we yeah, just did this study. Yeah, we just did, we just did a study of uh, pre-hospital cath lab activations at our institution. There were in a, a year, a little over a year, there were 117 paramedic pre-hospital cath lab activations. 
Turned out that 48 of them were true omis and 69 were false positives. Then we applied the queen to all those cases. She recognized all 48 true omis and decreased false positives from 69 to 29. But it gets even better because a lot of those pre-hospital EKGs, they're on, they were recorded on the Zoll machine and the Zoll machine does not record an S wave that goes down below a certain level. So the S wave gets cut off. When the S wave gets cut off, it makes the queen think the QRS amplitude is not very big. And then the T to QRS ratio becomes larger than it really is. And so the queen had the most of the, many of the false positives the queen had were in those, those cases where the S wave was cut off. So if we eliminated all cases where the S wave cut, was cut off and just looked at the ones that had a full recording, she still got 47 of 48 of the OMI, but the false positives were then down to 16. So the false positives went from 69 to 16 while not while only missing one OMI, which I think is amazing and could really save a lot of false cath lab activations. Totally agree. Um, Steve, here's a nice broad question. Um, how can we help with the OMI paradigm shift? Oh, by doing research on it and and by uh, uh, promoting it in social media and uh, publishing papers and just find, get data from your own institution and use it. Uh, uh, and we have, we have tools, the uh, Powerful Medical can, can provide you with research tools to do a study at your own institution on it. Next question. Circumflex occlusions are more difficult than other arteries to detect OMI. Any detective tips for that specific occlusion? Why don't you answer that one, Pendle? Um, the reason they are the most missed and the most difficult is because a lot of them involve the posterior area. Um, and that, unfortunately, the, um, the AHA refers to that as the inferior wall or the lateral wall. The point is that it's exactly opposite of leads V1 through V4. So whatever area you want to call that of your myocardium, that's the area the circumflex typically supplies, and it's an area that you don't have any leads for on the standard 12 lead. So the problem is that it's posterior semi, posterior only. Um, and so uh, the best paper about that is it was written by, by us, um, and um, we showed that if you have a normal QRS complex and you have ACS history, then ST depression in V1 through V4 that is maximal in V1 through V4 and not maximal in other leads like V5 and V6, is very specific for acute coronary occlusion of, of what I call the posterior wall. And in my opinion, uh, that finding would, would, would solve a, a vast majority of the problem of, of missed circumflex occlusions. Anything to add, Steve? I would just add that there are um, maybe up to 10% of acute coronary occlusions do not show anything on the EKG. There's no evidence of OMI on them. Even Pendle and I can't see it. Maybe it's 5%. And many of those are circumflex occlusions. So just because you see a totally normal EKG and just because Pendle and I can't see anything on it doesn't mean there's not an acute coronary occlusion. That's why we call it occlusion MI. We're not basing the definition of occlusion MI on any EKG finding or any particular EKG. It's just an occlusion. You got to figure out, is there an occlusion? And there are other ways, other modalities that may need to bring in to play other than the EKG, like if you get a troponin, the first troponin is positive and the patient presented with chest pain and they've got persistent chest pain, it's an OMI until proven otherwise. You've got to go to the cath lab, even though you see nothing on the EKG. So, uh, and this happens more often with circumflex occlusions than it does with RCA or LAD, but it also happens with RCA and LAD. You agree, Pendle? Anything to add to that? I agree. Yeah. Um, I just, I want to read this one comment because I think it, it provides a really nice uh, example of there are, you know, Steve and I, um, we, we let out some negativity sometimes because we have a problem with this and we really want things to change. But um, there are so many people on every in every specialty that are, are helping us and promoting this and, and, and doing well. I just want to read this one comment by, uh, it sounds like a cardiologist. Uh, it says, I am one of the, quote, bad interventional cardiologists you, quote, this. I thought I could read EKGs, but, but I could not. Over the last 10 years reviewing your blog, I have become much better. Thank you. I've, I rarely overrule an ER request for cath lab activation despite skepticism. I've also referred many residents and students to your blog. So really appreciate you. Um, uh, we know there are excellent people in, in every specialty and, and we really appreciate all of you helping us out. So thank you so much. And I'd also like to say, I, I'm, I don't mean to diss anyone. I, I just, it's the only, the only time I, I'm 
not um, as fully respectful as I should be is when people don't have that kind of openness that you are displaying here where they they persist in not not trying to learn these new things about EKGs and and they ref, they continue to be obstructionist and there there are some some of those uh, and cardiologists have uh, have enormous specialty they have so much to know it's just ridiculous how much they have to know and to expect them to know the the finer details of EKG reading is is not uh, is not fair to them uh, but it's also they need to be fair to themselves and realize that that they don't know everything about EKGs either just because they're cardiologists. All right. So, um, Sarah, do we, are we out of time or, or what do you think? I was just about to say that I would wrap up here, guys. Um, but as we mentioned before, we will do many more of these sessions and also reading the comments. People are very excited about this format. So unless you have last uh, words that you would like to share with anyone, I would uh, wrap up. Well, I'd just like to say thanks for listening and paying attention and um, your comments. I, we couldn't get to all of them, but they're all very interesting and, and uh, fun to read. And uh, we look forward to hosting the next one. Yeah, thank you guys very much for your time. And we are always looking forward to hearing everyone's feedback on this session. And as I said, you will be getting all the clinical validation, links to the access and previous sessions in your emails. So thank you everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your day. See you at the next one.